What is going on? Jason from YouTube here. We are going to talk about what I am doing with my portfolio today and over the next few days as we are dealing with this market pullback. As I'm recording this, the market is just about to open up. I checked and see what happened overnight, what's happening so far this morning. And so I feel like today is probably going to come down to neutral for me, meaning some of my stocks are up, some of my stocks are down. So we may find ourselves still in a pullback scenario where maybe the, the big market is down like a half a percent or 1%, but our personal portfolios that have taken a beating of 10%, 15% over the last couple of days will hopefully start to level out. And so what am I looking to buy? What am I looking to sell? What am I planning on just holding through all of this? That's what this video is gonna to cover today. Now, as always, it's not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just some guy on YouTube who does my best to research and look at the market, look at trends, see what's going on, and then make those decisions uh, for my portfolio, and then also tell you um, you know, just what I'm doing. And, and you make that decision for yourself. Um, I think the, the lesson that hopefully I'm seeing some people talk about, I wish I would have done, and that's you know on, on Facebook groups, on stock twitch groups, they're saying, I wish I would have done more research. And that is going to be the central focus of the video today. That on companies that I have researched in, on companies that I am comfortable in, that when they drop, that's a buying opportunity. I look at that as a discount. I don't look at, oh man, I just lost 15%. I'm, I'm like, should I sell this? I'm, I'm down so much. I look at it as, I wish I had more free cash right now because I still believe in this company. Whether I bought in at a lower price, I'm, I'm dollar cost averaging up, or whether I bought in here and the stock dropped here and so I'm dollar cost averaging down, really it's irrelevant because I believe in that company so much that it doesn't even matter. So that's kind of my overarching theme and then the companies I'm not believing in, I'm thinking just like that. Uh, maybe I should have done a bit more research. So um, I guess the question is uh, why, which again, we covered this in the live stream the other day, but the bonds started to go up. And so when the bond market goes up, people start saying, well, maybe I should look for a little bit more safety. Maybe I should look for a little bit more security. And so the historic bond number is 1.5% for a 10-year bond. And so if they can put in $1,000 and get you know that measly $15 a year, that's what people are looking for. That's the historic safe number. And again, as you get older, I think there is some maybe opportunity and reason to go into bonds because if you're old and you got a bunch of money, you know, the stock market does have pullbacks. They do have corrections. They there is a crash. It can happen. And so maybe a bond is right for you. But ultimately, what I think most investors are going to see this time is that at the end of the day, for right now where we're at, and again, we know a, a pullback's coming. We know that this won't last forever. The stocks have gone straight up. Real estate's gone straight up. Gold and silver's up. Bitcoin's up. I mean, like something has to give eventually, but I don't think that's happening yet because if you look at the bond market, 1.55%, 1.6% when I, when I started making this video, that's what it was at that we want inflation, we being uh, Janet Yellen and, uh, and the head of the Fed, that they want the, the interest uh, inflation at 2%. And so if you want inflation at 2% and you're promising a 1.5% return, you're losing 0.5% of your money every year. And so while again, we need to raise bond money, that is the US government, because we're about to sign a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. So somebody's gotta pay for that. And one of the ways they do that is through the bond program. But if we're bringing in 1.9 trillion, inflation's probably gonna hit that 2%, maybe even higher, as we are talking about more and more stimulus and welfare and PPP, all that money comes from somewhere. So when we're creating new currency, inflation is bound to go up. And so you really don't wanna be in a 1.5% bond if inflation's gonna be two or two and a half percent for that coming year. And so again, as I look at the stock market, I think the worst is over. Again, we may have some more little pullbacks. And again, I mentioned this a bunch last night, but go back and look at the 12 month chart. 
we have so much room to give that a little 3% correction, 4% correction is not hurting us long term. Now, if you got in the stock market the last month or two months and you're uh, you know, heavily invested in one company, yeah, the last three or four days may have been absolutely brutal for you. For me, it was. I lost a whole lot more than 3% because I'm heavily invested in Microvision and Nano and Tesla. There are a couple of companies that I hold a good amount of my portfolio in, and so I don't see a 3% drop. I see a 15% drop like over the course of this week. Now, what am I actually doing? So let me just go ahead and jump into this. Uh, I did want to start with a quote from Warren Buffett. You guys know, uh, while I there's things that Warren Buffett says sometimes that I don't agree with on, on you know where we're at, and you know I talked badly about his right hand man the other day outside GameStop. I do think there is a reason Warren Buffett is successful, and some of his quotes about the market are just spot on. And so he has said this before that unless you can see fifty percent of the money that you have invested in the stock market drop and not have a panic attack. So if you see your portfolio drop 50% and not have a panic attack, that's the time you should be invested in the market. And so what he's saying is, if you panic at every correction or drop or pullback or even a full on crash, if you're in full on panic mode, the stock market may not be for you. That there is an inherent risk that comes in the stock market. I've heard people call it gambling. I don't think it's quite gambling because we can do research. We, we know that we can invest in companies and over the course of the long term, we believe in those companies, but there are sometimes things we, we, we see coming, but we don't think it's gonna affect us that bad, like this bonds. The bonds started creeping up on us, but certainly we didn't think it was actually gonna pull back as hard as it did and people sell off their their uh, index funds and their S&P 500s and their other ETFs that, that you know hold the total stock market. And so the whole stock market sees a nice little pullback as people start putting their money into bonds. And so that's kind of what's happened over the last two days. Now, what am I buying? What am I buying? So the first stock I'm buying and I'm looking to buy, I mentioned it about four days ago, and that's uh, Palantir. PLTR, they were up around $30. They, they took a little pullback. That's when I was getting in around 27, 28. And that's when the news of Kathy Wood and ARK Invest putting a bunch of money into them. And I thought, okay, this is a great buying opportunity. So I put a little bit of money in. And then over the course of the last week, they've continued to drop. Now, the question is why have they continued to drop? Well, some of the big wigs have sold off their shares. This is the time of the year where big wigs sell off their shares. It is their uh, tax season. And so what's the best way for them to pay taxes? Sell off a couple shares, my taxes are covered. Um, obviously though, when that happens, it makes us a little nervous. Share price usually drops because uh, investor, um, you know, the, the, the bullish thesis starts getting a little hurt when it's like, hey, why are you selling your shares? Do you not believe in your company? But again, this is standard fare for a lot of big wigs at a lot of big companies. Also, they just teamed up with 3M. 3M is the gold standard of companies. They've been around forever. They've adapted and adjusted and have just continued to come up with good products. And so when you team up with a 3M, I think that helps build your brand trust over the long term, meaning that 3M is only gonna partner with companies that they believe in for the long term. I think for me, this is a no brainer, just because as we talk about the future, we always talk about tech in general, but what exactly is it about tech that, that we like so much? Why is the world going more tech? What does that mean? You know, everybody already has a phone, we all have computers, you know, people have iPads, uh, you will watch TV, like what does that mean? Well, I think inside of tech, there are several little factors um, that, that drive that tech, but I think the number one most important factor, and this is back at the beginning before tech was around, and this is going to be now, this is going to be the future and forever, that ultimately it's knowledge and information that is really the power. And I don't mean to sound like, uh, you know, sitting here in my garage with two Lamborghinis, but knowledge and information is going to be the power. And so if you look at a company like Facebook or Google 
and you go, I use Gmail, I use Facebook, all that stuff is free. What? How do they make all their money? Well, it's, it's your information. They have your information, so they have knowledge about you. That's the power. Whether they use it or sell it, that, that's where the money comes from. And if you've never heard that before, I'm, I'm sorry for, for breaking your privacy bubble, but that's where it's at. And so Palantir, that is what they do. They aggregate data. They pull information. They, they, they put spatial things together into a nice little spreadsheet to help companies market to you better, to help companies understand their own employees. It scans all of their emails and gives a personality profile for their own employees. And again, they're not the ones out there, you know, they're not hacking into your email, they're not going that far, but everything they do, companies are asking them to come in and do. And so again, uh, tech, information, power, knowledge is power, I, I just don't see it's going anywhere. Uh, another company I'm buying, and this got mentioned by uh, a YouTuber I follow named Jeremy. Uh, he mentioned it, I don't know, maybe like two weeks ago in a live stream, mentioned it about a week ago, and then even mentioned it, I think, within the last few days again. And that's Corsair Gaming, and I'm not going to, again, this video is already getting long, so I'm not going to do a full breakdown on it, but I really like the gaming industry. I like the online gaming industry. I think that's going to be the future of gaming. I mean, I, it's already the present, but I think that's just the industry and market that continues to grow. And so this stock got beaten down over the last few days. And so again, this is not an all in play. It's just something that I'm adding a little bit. I think I bought maybe one, one and a half percent a few days ago, uh, you know, a week or two ago, and it's taken a little dip. And so I'm going to continue to add into that uh, very slowly. Um, I'm going to also look at uh, increasing my positions on some of my stuff that was cheap. And so Genius and Rolls-Royce, I've done several videos on both of those companies. Rolls-Royce, I think, is fail-proof just because of their ties to the British government. And right now their stock is taking a beating because they focus heavily on commercial airline use. But the other half of their business that's maintaining is military use and so they've stayed afloat because they're selling stuff to us united states military to the british military this you know they're on the submarine project that's supposed to be done in 2030 and so i don't see rolls royce going anywhere but their stock has been completely beat down to a dollar fifty where yeah i think it's going to take a run five six bucks when the recovery officially starts and so that's kind of my stock that's betting on the world going back to normal especially air travel and so i think that's going to happen again i'm not going to say sooner than later i just think it's going to happen period and so i'm going to buy rolls royce for as cheap as i can genius is an education company they have all the right partnerships they got arnold schwarzenegger they got uh stanley marvel universe they have just so many partnerships coming up they got warren buffett um, the app is just highly reviewed. The deal is right now, they're just not that well known. And so when you look at their base of not just stockholders, but as you look at their base of people who use their product, they absolutely love it. They just need to work on that PR. And so the, the, the CEO, Andy Hayward, has come out and said, we're hiring a new PR guy that we're about to hit the PR movement. We're not there yet, but we're about to. Again, they got partnerships with Shaq. Uh, Arnold. So as these things come out, I think they're going to hit that PR blitz. And that's going to be a stock that I could see jump up very quickly because it's been around for a while. It's It's been a pump and dump before. And so people are going to say, okay, we're, this is for real this time. And they're going to quickly jump in. And that's something that, again, in the future that I could see 5Xing in the course of three months. And again, I don't know when that's going to be because it's just based on their PR. That when are they going to go heavy on customer acquisition because right now they're just building that wide base and again i got several several videos on that um, i also have some rider dies uh recently in these stocks we were very fortunate that over the last i would say maybe six months there have been a slew of ipos new companies or uh, old companies just getting completely revised that are hitting the the right time in the world with the right product for you know the right timing of, of just where we're at 
And so, you know, a company that we talked about early on was Jivo. It's like a dollar fifty, dollar sixty, dollar seventy is when we first started buying in back November, December. And we've seen, you know, a seven X, eight X run. Now it's back down to like five X, six X. But that's just something that that I'm not selling. Um, on low days when everything is is blood red and I have an extra twelve bucks sitting in the account, I'll buy I'll buy a share of Jivo. Nano and NDN. The future is 3D printing. Unless you're living in a box, you know all the benefits of 3D printing. It's going to save uh, companies, I mean, months and months and years of developing product when they can just go over to the 3D printer, type it in, and think about this. Every time that they would send off to get a patent or they'd send off to get uh, that, that thing built, you're suddenly opening yourself up to all of that information getting stolen. But if you have a machine in-house that is completely private, that only certain people have access to, that's not connected to the internet, you could build out and spec out a new product and not have to worry about the competition. And, and you could tweak it the way that the 3D printing, uh, the ink works for nano dimensions. It's just, there are worlds of everybody else. The only fear right now that people have is, are they gonna be able to afford one of these machines because they're several hundred thousand dollars? And I think the answer is yes, because obviously the price is gonna come down as, as that's just how things go in the electronic and, and tech world. Prices come down because things just are able to be found and built cheaper and cheaper. And so I think those become a little bit more affordable. But on the long term, I think you're gonna see that this product is saving companies not just hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, but millions of dollars because of how quickly they can build out something that they, you know, used to take them years and used to take people years to build on. Now you're gonna be able to build that out very soon. And so I, I just think 3D printing is super, super exciting. Uh, my other my ride or die medium, you know, being, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars is microvision. Um, I've done several videos on microvision. There are several people out there talking about microvision, whether it's the guys like Chartology and Trace Trades focusing on you know, the, the action points there, or it's a guy like me just kind of breaking it down on why I think this is so much needed. They are doing something called LiDAR. And so what that does is it's, it's the part that goes into self-driving cars that makes them possible. Tesla uses a camera system, and it's kind of known in the industry that the camera system is not going to uh, be the best for long-term use. And so I think this LiDAR, whether it's uh, Ford or Apple or Microsoft, that there's going to be a company that comes around and buys them sooner than later. Plus they also have some other things going on with some military stuff. But Microvision is not focused right now, like Nano, they're focused on the end user. They're actually building a 3D printer. Or Microvision, they have the technology and they have this little product that's very sleek and slim, which is why I think it's appealing to Apple, but they're not actually selling that to the consumer. And so I think Microvision, it's only a matter of time before they get bought out. Where Nano, on the other hand, they're raising money to buy other companies to, to you know, figure out how can we get 3D printing involved in everything that we need to and get this out to the end user and do as well as we can. Um, although Nano CEO has said that if there was a juicy enough offer that he would sell the company. Uh, but he is he's a really interesting guy. If you're interested in Nano, you should really look him up. Uh, the CEO is just super interesting guy. Um, some other shares, again, I, I know this video is getting long, but I just want to, people often ask, like, what stocks are you actually holding? And the deal is, I'm, I'm, I've tried to slim down my positions to about 25 that told you where I like to be. And that number's gotten up to 35, 40 here recently. And so I'm kind of saying, you know, you know, you know better than that. You know that you should have kept out more cash which my cash got really low, under 5% at one point. And uh, I, I want to keep 10, 15, 20% cash, 20% for the days like we've had this last week, and then let that go down to 10% and then still be able to buy here and there on a day like today. But I started at 10%, used up all of it, but like 2%. And so I'm sitting here today saying, I don't really have a whole lot of cash, but I'll still buy some red stuff if I see it, but I'm running out of cash for the time being. And so... Um, I am looking at selling things and I'll let you know what those are in a little bit. Um, but one of the things that I'm just absolutely holding, um, Airbnb, I, I got in early, um, but I, I have sold off a couple of shares. Their share lockup price or time is about to come up. And so I think the price is gonna drop. 
And so when I see price coming in on 215, 220, 225, I'll probably sell a little bit more just because I do think that stock is still gonna drop. So if you're not an Airbnb and you like that company, again, very long-term, that's where I'm at. I, I like the company, again, super long-term just because uh, the way their fundamentals work, but they're spending a ton of money on advertising right now. But eventually there will be Airbnbs in every city they will no longer have to advertise to bring in hosts and all of us that are using Airbnb now, we don't need any advertisement. And so the advertisement is not going to us, the people who's renting uh, or going to stay in Airbnb, they just need more hosts specifically in some areas. But once they get that figured out and once they're there, well, that whole line item goes away and that's like 40, 50% of their revenue right now. And so they're about to become 40 to 50% more profitable in a very short amount of time once they get all of the hosts that they need. And so I think that's just gonna make them ridiculously profitable out of that world, but that's not gonna happen for a long time. And so for me, I did not buy them in IPO. Uh, I bought them on their drop. So my share price average, dollar cost average, was around 140, 145. And so seeing this run up to two, 220, and even the, the you know a slight pullback to 190 or whatever it hit, um, that's something that I'm just planning on holding. But I will sell as it gets higher because I do think it's going to take a drop before it goes up big. Um, other stuff I'm holding, I'm holding on my Apple. I'm holding on my Tesla. Um, Again, not that I own a lot of it because those are expensive, but I'm, I'm not going to sell it at a loss or I'm not going to sell it with, it, they're not a loss because I got in at good prices, especially like Tesla. Um, you know, I, I bought Tesla uh, in 2020. Again, it was later than I wish I would have, but when you got in the fall, I mean, you know, you got to see a, a run from 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, all the way up to, you know, was it 950, 990, something like that. And so when, the price is at 700 i look at it and i go well i could still sell and make a lot of money but i think it's going to come roaring back so why would i sell it you know that's i think they're just a good opportunity right now and for some of my shares i'm getting close to switching them over to uh to capital gains you know i will have held them for 12 months and so i'm going to hold on there just to get the tax benefit um cciv I told you my plan on them uh, right from the very beginning. I put a very large position in it and that was kind of like the end of my free cash. I had 20% of my cash like, you know, two months ago and then I put a, a large portion in CCIV and I never really fully recovered from that. But with that said, um, I, I was planning on selling swing trading CCIV, which I did and I sold about 50%. And the other 50% I still have, and I'm still good on it. You know, I got it at 17, it's sitting around $30 now, but I want to see what's gonna happen with Lucid Air. I'm really interested to see what happens with that company. I think, I think that they are going to have the funding and I know that there was a lot of, you know, uh, hatred toward the pipe investment and all that, but you gotta look and think, how did the company get here? You know, that the Saudi Arabia money, all the uh, people who, who knew um, their CEO, you know, the, the former lead engineer at Tesla uh, for, the, for the Model S, they've known a lot of people. They've been getting a lot of money in. And so I think that that company is going to hit the ground real quick. Obviously, there's going to be bad news. It's electric vehicles, man. Like if you haven't been watching Tesla or Lee or x or any of them, bad things happen, production slows down, have a factory that shuts down, a part shortage, things like that happen. So will Lucid Air be a rough ride? Of course, but over the course of the long term, I think they have a lot of really solid investors on their team that want to take up some of the market share. And so I'm gonna stay holding 50% of that just to see where that goes over the course of the long term. Facebook, um, it's hit my dollar cost average. That's how much it's dropped. Uh, it was up a little bit in, in pre-market today over it, but I'm right at my dollar cost average. So I could sell it and walk away and just say, ah, I hate Facebook. And at the end of the day, like I know Facebook with the political season that's happened over the last three months, it's easy to get an opinion about Facebook, but this is what I need you to know. That at the end of the day, we know that commercials for TV are going down. We know the best space to advertise is one, YouTube, right? But the other best place to advertise, and this is someone who works for a business who's been in there as we talk about an advertising budget, where does everybody hang out? Facebook. That our, our ideal customer always hangs out on Facebook. And I feel like a lot of companies 
realize that Facebook is where they need to be in advertising. And so money is always gonna flow to Facebook and Facebook also takes all of our data, all of our information that we gladly surrender. And I know it's like, well, I didn't read the terms of agreement. It doesn't matter, you would have signed them anyway. Facebook is important enough that you want it to connect with your friends, family, see the pictures, all that good stuff, be in the Facebook groups. And so when I think about Facebook, I just don't see a scenario where they're not around. And they just, again, weathered a very rough season over this political season. And there were a lot of competitors that mentioned, and yet here we all are still on Facebook. That all those people who talked about deleting Facebook and blah, 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 they're still on Facebook. And maybe they're not on every day, all day like they used to be. Maybe they only check it once a week. Maybe they only get on for the pictures, but they're still there. And so if they're still there, advertisements are still going to come and try to find them because they know Republican, Democrat, independent, old, young, race, demographic, none of it matters because we're all still on Facebook. And so the advertisements on Facebook is limitless because they can target you. They can say, I want to find a 40 year old female who lives in Arkansas and within this you know, five mile radius. And they are gonna put that money there. They're gonna run that ad. And you may only check Facebook once a week or once a month, but every time you check Facebook, you're gonna see that same advertisement because you are targeted. And so I just don't see a scenario where Facebook goes down. So I'm gonna continue to hold Facebook. Will there come a day when I sell it? I don't see it right now, just because, again, I know the younger generation is not getting on Facebook as quickly, but what I've seen is that there's been enough time. You know, I'm, in, I'm 34, 35, and so Facebook came out in 2004 when I was 18, 19 years old, and so Facebook was right up my alley. We were transitioning off MySpace, getting on Facebook, and I've had Facebook ever since for the last 17 years. Wow, that's crazy to say. And as I was getting older, you know, 25, 26, the 15 year old kids of the world were not getting Facebook. They were focused on Instagram. They were, you know, Snapchat was just coming out and all these other social media platforms. But now that those people who said no to Facebook the first time are turning 25, 26, 27, are saying, you know what? Maybe I should get Facebook just because everybody's on it. And so it's almost like a graduation where ah, I guess it's time to get Facebook. And we thought LinkedIn was gonna take away all of the professional world, but it didn't. We're all still here on Facebook. And so again, do I love Facebook as, as like a company? No, do I like the Zucks? I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. Like, it just doesn't matter because at the end of the day, the money will continue to flow to Facebook because we all use it. That's where we're all at. So advertisers are going to find us. Um, here we go, too cheap to sell. I know this video is getting long, but hopefully again, people have asked me to do this. So hopefully you'll stick with me. Um, some things I think that were, I, I mentioned that were too cheap to sell. And so right now, I, you guys know I, I'm ITP, the mask company. Um, my plan was for it to double. It didn't quite get there. It got up to like 90, 80%. So I started selling some, started dropping. So I sold a little bit more just because I wasn't sure what the bottom was gonna be. Um, I'm still holding about 50% of my original position in there. And it's kind of dropped, it's hit my dollar cost average. So I'm kind of like, well, do I just cut my money and run? Or do I wait for a bump up? So I'm gonna give ITP, um, basically once the market stops dropping across the board, that's when I'll make my decision. So if we see green today, by the end of the day, if we see green Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and ITP is still holding, I'll probably go ahead and sell out. Uh, obviously I'm gonna research the company and see what they're doing. If they're doing anything silly, like trying to raise funds, they put a 30 day halt on any offerings and that's what made it appealing at that price point was to get in and get out in those 30 days. But we're coming up on those 30 days. So if they do another offering, um, I'm probably definitely gonna get out of that even if I have to take a little bit of a loss just because again, I don't believe in the company long-term. But if I can see you know, 10, 20, 30% run, which we've already done uh, because again, masks are not going anywhere. Europe is banning the, the, the cloth masks and they need the paper medical mask. And so ITP had some good things coming up with their approval process. They got approved in China. They were seeking approval in Europe and even seeking approval here in the US from, um, uh, I can't remember what agency, but they were trying to get approval saying that this is a medical grade mask. And once that happens, I think the, the mask will do very, very well. But ultimately, I think the pandemic is going to slow down. 
hopefully sooner than later, just because that's, you know, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with it. But whether by vaccine or by herd immunity, I think we're going to get there. And so a mask company is not what I want to be in in three years from now. You know, I'm, I'm just not going to be there. So, uh, you know, I've talked about that company a lot. I've also talked about GSAT. Um, I even mentioned last night that I would be looking at my position. Maybe I should sell it. Maybe I shouldn't. Um, but I'm, I'm still holding them. Um, everything I saw about the company, you know, three, two weeks ago when I bought in is still there. So I'm not worried about them at all. So I'm going to wait and see that they recover properly before I look at, at selling. My original price point on that was really low, like $6, $7. And then I got really optimistic thinking, oh man, this could run up to nine or 10. This could be like a Jivo that, that takes a better run than I could have ever guessed or anticipated. And so I actually added to some of my position a week ago uh, when they just had a, a minor pullback intraday. I had just had a limit set, it hit the limit. I bought some more, so I was really excited about that. Um, and then obviously it's taken a beat down over the course of the last week with everything, but I still believe in the company. So I'm still holding GSAT. I know I mentioned last night that I may sell it, but I'm not going to be selling that. Now, what will I be selling? Obviously I've talked about, you know, all this money about buying this, buying that, buying that. And it's like, dude, you just said you were strapped on cash. What are you selling? So what am I selling? Um, there were some things that went up, uh, all my days run together here. I think it was Tuesday, the first day of our pullback. Everything was down except for dividend stocks and basically travel recovery stocks that the vaccine was getting some good information that it looked promising. Now, the next day, Thursday, I think it was, or Wednesday, there was some bad news that came out. I think Carnival canceled some crews, Disney canceled some crews, so they all took a hit. But I, I did sell some and I will be looking to sell these quickly as they recover um, and, and get to prices that I think are okay. Again, when I sell, I usually do it very, very slowly. And so, you know, if I were to, let's say just for easy figuring, if I were to own 100 shares, I would sell, you know, five at this point, five, five for another 25 cents, five for another 25 cents, five for another 25 cents. And so if that stock continues to run, I'm not saying, oh man, I, I sold too much at the beginning, that I'm still getting it. Or if that's the top and it starts dropping down, I can still sell again. And I just, that's the way I do it. Uh, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but that's how I do. I just set limits. That way I don't have to watch it all day and I'll set my limits crazy high. You know, what if uh, what if Carnival Cruise goes to $1,000? Well, I will sell, I will have my last five shares that I will be selling. You know, if it goes up 20X intraday, I will be ready for it. Which actually happened with American Airlines the other day. Uh, it was part of the whole GameStop run up. I have no idea, but intraday, it took like a 50% run and then by the end of the day, it came back down. So sometimes when you know you're gonna sell something, setting those sell limits uh, can help. And so, uh, you know, even as we think about AMC and GameStop, which we'll cover at the end. So what am I selling? I'm selling my cruise lines, airlines, uh, some other things that I invested in early on, I think before I started uh, doing YouTube um, was Puma. Um, I like Puma, I, I just started seeing them more and more. I started getting advertising, I started buying their stuff, and so I was like, well, I wonder what Puma share price is. And it was, you know, seven or eight dollars, took a run up to 10 or 11, very slowly. And so I'm gonna sell some of them. Foot Locker, um, I'm selling some of them. I like Foot Locker. They own a bunch of subsidiaries, um, you know, as, as a basketball coach, they own the uh, brand East Bay Sports, and I didn't know that till like three years ago, I did an order from East Bay, and I was talking to customer service and they're like, oh, shoot us an email. It's, you know, so-and-so at Foot Locker. And I was like, Foot Locker? I thought you guys were East Bay. And they're like, oh, we're, we're owned by the same company. I was like, Phew. you know, and this is before I was hardcore into stock. So it was like, my mind wasn't even thinking. And then, you know, recently um, when I started looking at what companies I just personally like that had gotten hurt, that's the way I was thinking March, April, May, is I might as well just invest in companies that I like, that I wanna see around. Foot Locker was one of them, so I put a, a good amount of money in Foot Locker, and it's taken a, a good run the last few days. Same with Under Armour. And so again, these are companies that I just owned for a brief amount of time as a recovery stock, and so that's you know just different things that have recovered that I'm looking to get out of. Um, Cisco, it, it's a good stock, it's a good dividend stock, um, but I'll be looking to close on my position there. Um, Kohl's, just again, April hit, everything crashed. I started just buying stocks that I liked. I like Kohl's, there were certain hotels that I bought, the stuff out in Las Vegas, I think all those are good options. Um, but again, I, I'm gonna be looking at selling those, not that they're fully recovered, but I think that there's better opportunities 
elsewhere. And again, for a lot of these things, I'm coming up on my one year mark. And so that's what makes it a little bit more tempting to sell. Um, two companies I'm not sure if I'm gonna sell. I just, if I needed the cash, I would sell them because they have recovered. But at the end of the day, I really, really like them as companies. And I don't know if I like them as stocks, but I like them as companies and I do like to invest in companies that I like. And that's Top Golf, ticker symbol ELY, Callaway Golf, and Play. Dave and Buster's. I really like Dave and Buster's. I really like Top Golf, and so it would hurt me to sell, knowing that I'm hurting that company. Uh, but on the flip side, their stocks have done very well. I've seen over 100% gains in both of those. But I really like them, and they're still doing well. But if I needed that cash, I would use it somewhere else. But that's probably the last couple stocks that I would buy. And for those companies, again, I'm coming up very close um, on when I bought in in March and April to crossing those over to the other tax bracket. Now, the bonus, let's talk about AMC and GameStop for a second. Um, I made a little bit of money back during the first run up a month ago, and then I also got caught holding the bag on things, which again, it's not the end of the world. Um, I wanted the movement to happen, I wanted the gamma squeeze to happen, and so I was glad to give a few dollar donations to see the gamma squeeze, to stick it to the hedge funds, to stick it to Citron, to make those guys realize that we are a force to be reckoned with. And so the other day I did the live outside of GameStop and when I got, when I saw the report of you know some old guy basically saying, get off my lawn, we shouldn't have let you done that, that fired me back up again. And so I said, hey, if I lose money on GameStop, you know, again, that's just for me where I'm at. I'm not, again, not financial advice and not telling you to throw money away on GameStop. But the thought that they are shorting GameStop again, the fact that they are, they watched, you know, Deep Values interview and thought, ha ha ha, watch this, we're going to continue to short you. Um, so if there's a chance that we can do the gamma squeeze and that GameStop runs to, you know, hundreds or thousands and we have a chance to stick it to them. I want to be a part of that movement. Again, it is a complete gamble. It is more of, I guess when I when I buy those shares, I just think of it as a donation. If I get it back, great. That's why I'm not doing a full AMC or GameStop review because again, this is extra not financial advice. I mean, nothing is ever financial advice, but this is extra not financial advice. This is just where I'm at. Um, I, I want to see us people be able to stick it to the suits. I want to see those hedge funds cry. I want to see those guys come back on TV and say, I'm just out here trying to make money. And it's like, dude, you're a billionaire. You're, you know, like, don't give me that speech. Like you're, like you're one of us out here suffering uh, through this coronavirus nonsense and employment and, and where your next paycheck is going to come from. And if you're going to be able to do rent at the end of the month and put food on the table, like don't try to act like you're one of us that's suffering through all this together. And so if I can do anything to stick it to those guys, I'm going to. So I'm holding my AMC. I'm holding my GameStop. Um, did I take a little bit of profits last time? Yeah, I did. But I, I mean, just a small amount. I'm talking less than 10%. I told you I did my tier thing up. And so my GameStop was going to sell when it hit 5,000. Never hit 5,000, so it didn't sell. But it did sell, I think, when it hit like 350 or 360. I sold, you know, a couple shares of my, you know, 15 that I owned or whatever. So anyway, um, that's what I'm doing with GameStop and AMC. I'm just going to hold this through. I have my limits. I think AMC, I have it set around 100 bucks. GameStop, I have it set around 5,000 bucks. So if it hits it, great. If not, you know, we still stuck it to the suits. Hopefully that they will not be able to hit their strike prices. And hopefully if they're shorting it, that they will have to continue to pay a high interest rate. And um, and again, any money that we can that we can punish the shorters with. I don't like shorting companies. I've told you that for a long time. Just I don't like the whole principle of rooting for someone else to leave. And then I guess what what drew the line in the sand for me, and I, I shorted the only company I've ever shorted is Palantir or not Palantir, uh, Peloton. Um, just because I thought they were silly. I'm not a huge fan of of their product. It's super expensive. So I shorted them. I made a few bucks, and I. It felt a little bit badly about it. So I was like, I'm not going to short any more companies. It's just, you know, I don't like rooting for companies to fail. But recently I read an article that said if they can get shorters, if shorters can get a company to completely go out of business. So we're talking about Blockbuster. We're talking about Circuit City. We're talking about Radio Shack. If they can get you to go completely out of business. So they short you at five bucks. You go down to zero. So they just made $5 per share on you. Plus they don't have to pay taxes on it. And so they are not just hoping and, 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 you know, I hope this company goes down over the next few weeks. 
They're hoping you go out of business. And so when they attack a company like GameStop that's really struggling right now, or AMC that's really struggling right now, to me, that's just kicking somebody when they're down. And it's not just about that company and stock, it's about the people that work there. That I know people who work at GameStop. I know people who work at AMC. And so when you're rooting for those people to be unemployed, I do not mind donating, buying a few shares, and holding them just to see if we can punish you for being such a mean person. So that's where I'm at. Again, 40 minute video, whoo! If you guys made it this far, thanks for watching. If you got any value out of this, hopefully you did. Man, this took me a long time to prepare for. Make sure you hit that like button. If you you know like the content and you go, this is really valuable, share it with a friend or family. You know, Trying to get the sub base to grow uh, up over 6,000, man, I would have never thought that we would have done that, start this journey in December. Here we're at 6,000, so appreciative of that. Um, and uh, it's just been a fun, fun ride. So thank you guys for watching so much. I will see you all in my next video.